Welcome to the LDS Mission Cast, a podcast to educate and inspire in the great cause of missionary work. This is your host, Nick Galetti. Ben Spackman is our guest on this episode. He's an interesting type of scholar. His educational background is so varied that I'm not sure there is anyone who has repeated his same course of study. As a result, I find his insights to be good food for thought. His area of expertise deals a lot with ancient scripture, ancient languages. and Sometimes we don't spend much time as missionaries considering the role of ancient scripture in our lives, but we don't always know what the Bible means or, or how the Bible is used in other faith traditions. The people that we go out and teach view the Bible differently than we do as Latter-day Saints. As a result, when we use the scriptures to teach the gospel, we sometimes get confused when others don't see the Bible the same way that we do. So Brother Spackman is here to help us know how to better use the Bible as a teaching tool in missionary work. Well, I'm pleased to have as our guest on this episode, Ben Spackman, who can be found on the interwebs at Benjamin the Scribe is his blog at Pathios. And we'll put links to that at the uh, notes for this episode at LDSMissionCast.com. But uh, I want to welcome Ben Spackman, who is, how would you describe, are you an a, a ancient scripture guy, or how, how would you describe You know, I, I think of myself at this point as kind of an eclectic historian. Okay. Because my, my training has been very broad. I've done a lot of ancient Near Eastern languages and ancient history and Old Testament, but I've also done a lot of modern Modern in the sense of after Alexander the Great, 323 BC, was the distinction between ancient and modern in in my graduate (laughs) program. I do history of science. I do history of Reformation and American religious history as my PhD focus, kind of history of science and religion. And so I I run the gamut. I've had classes in Sumerian history. I've had classes in Mormonism post-1945. For me, it all kind of comes together talking about evolution creationism, because those involve understanding Genesis in its ancient setting, understanding why people today read the Bible the way they do in light of science and religious history in the last 500 years after the Enlightenment and the Scientific Revolution, which are big major periods that you might have heard of but don't necessarily know anything about. But they're they're big and important things. So I'm an eclectic historian. Yeah, and you have some language backgrounds too with some yeah, of these ancient languages. Yeah, I, uh, I did a lot of Semitic languages, the old classical version. So that would include Hebrew and Aramaic, the two languages of the Old Testament. I did about four years of classical Arabic, Assyrian and Babylonian. So those would be familiar from the Old Testament, as well as something called Ugaritic, which people don't know, but it's it's quite important if you're doing Old Testament, Ugaritic is because it's similar time period, very close geographically. And it turns out that a lot of things the Old Testament refers to but doesn't explain get explained in the Ugaritic material. So that was, uh, I did about six years of Semitics at the University of Chicago, and that's kind of the background I bring to the modern history stuff and in interpreting the Bible. So I yeah. do a lot of Old Testament work. I also do a lot of modern history, what they call intellectual history, history of ideas. How okay. do people think and why? And where did you serve your mission? I was mostly in France and okay. a little bit in Belgium. Okay. So when did you start to get into this? Was it on your mission, before your mission? I, well, you know, I always felt like I slept through seminary. I grew up in Minnesota, and so we had early morning seminary that started at 5.15 yeah. every day. And early morning seminary in Minnesota in January That's cold. is a challenge. Yeah. And when I got into the MTC, everyone in my group quickly labeled me as the scholar and scriptorian. And I thought, well, if I slept through seminary and I'm the scriptorian, (laughs) the state of things is pretty bad. Um, But then I I had always been interested in languages. And on my mission, I got very interested in the Bible and languages. And I read the New Testament several times in the King James Version and in our French Bible. And um, I compared them. I read the Old Testament a little. It was really on my mission. I came home and I was set on doing linguistics as a major with Greek and Hebrew as my two languages and then going to medical school. Wow. uh, Where'd that go? (laughs) That, uh, as I got more and more into it, I ended up, I did a semester in Jerusalem. I got very Old Testament centric and I ended up changing into Near Eastern Studies, which now has a wonderful major at BYU that's changed since I was there. You, You do Near Eastern Studies and you either pick a Hebrew Bible emphasis or a Greek New Testament emphasis. (laughs) 
I was in organic chemistry for majors. <laughs> when I kind of came to the, the breaking point where I said, you know, I don't know what it's like to be a doctor. I mean, my dad was a doctor. My grandpa was a doctor. I've got an uncle that's a doctor, another one that's a dentist. I don't know what the day-to-day is like. But I find the Hebrew Old Testament stuff to be so fascinating and cool that I think I'm going to make a career out of that instead of jumping through the rest of the hoops to take the MCAT and then four more years of science and medical school and then another four years of residency and three years of specialization. And um, my career path has been winding and unpredictable, (laughs) but my Old Testament background has really been extremely important for me. And that kind of came from your mission, you said? Yeah, it really started on my mission. I really read the Bible a lot on my mission, and um, that set the track I was on. I would say that uh, when I was in Jerusalem, I asked one of our professors, I said, I've noticed that we have a lot more Mormon New Testament professors than Old Testament. Why is that? And he said, I don't know. And uh, in retrospect, I think it's because the New Testament is obviously more gospel-centric. It's where Jesus is and so on. But if you think about the Old Testament, the New Testament assumes you have knowledge of the Old Testament. The Book of Mormon is an Old Testament people. The books of Moses and Abraham are set with Old Testament characters. Really, the only thing that isn't directly Old Testament related is DNC. And even that presumes a good knowledge of the Bible. Right. The temple ordinances, the better you know the Old Testament, the more you will find those ordinances to be familiar as opposed to strange. I wish we would do more with that. And for me, this is a very current thing. A lot of people today in the church seem to be struggling with, and I would summarize it this way, how can prophets and apostles be wrong? Yeah. How can we trust in them the, the fallibility if they prophets, can be yeah. wrong? And whether that happens to be uh, the priesthood and temple ban or things that are uncomfortable like polygamy or whatever the issue is, that's almost kind of that Protestant inerrancy, except for us, instead of the Bible, it's living prophets and apostles. I mean, there's actually a book. It's one of my favorite Old Testament books. It's called um, Sacred Word, Broken Word, Biblical Authority in the Dark Side of Scripture, where the author says, how can we as Protestants put our faith in this thing that has misogyny and murder and, you know, slavery and all these things? And the New Testament says nothing against slavery, by the way. It assumes it. Right. How can we have trust in something that is so wrong at times? And if you want to be really basic, you either say, well, you know, I just accept that slavery was okay and God is in favor of genocide at times. And that's really what we have to deal with in a sense in modern church history. And for me, studying the Old Testament has given me a great view of how revelation works and prophets and inspiration and scripture work. And I bring that into my understanding of modern church history and prophets and apostles. And it's a complicated topic. I've talked about it in in other settings that we can link to. But for me, the Old Testament is really kind of the center of my testimony in that sense because it undergirds the Book of Mormon and the temple and how I understand modern prophets and apostles. And it makes up a majority, as we said, of our canon. And it is the biggest book of our our scripture. But it's probably one of the least understood. I, I agree. I think it's underused. So one of the things that I wanted to have you on to talk about, because you you talked about the study and the different approaches throughout time that people have had towards the reading and, as a result, kind of the implementation of the Bible as it's interpreted. And we as Latter-day Saints and even as missionaries, we have an interpretation on the Bible, as many do, and we often try to teach that interpretation. So as missionaries, one of the things that we do, and I wanted to introduce this right off the bat, and we've all kind of done this at different points in our life, is this concept of proof texting. So what is proof texting, specifically when it comes to using the Bible to teach, let's put in air quotes, the gospel? Right. So proof texting gets its name because you are taking a particular text, usually you know a verse or even just a line. You're taking that text and using it as proof in support of some idea or doctrine. And oftentimes with proof texting, and everyone does this, lay people, Mormons, Protestants, Catholics, everyone does this. Usually this involves particular wording and not looking at the text very closely in context. And a lot of times when you take something that you think supports this particular doctrine 
When you go and you read it in context, you look at the verses before and after it, and you you maybe look at it in another translation of the Bible, or you do a little bit of historical, cultural research on what it would have meant to the people at the time, you learn that it, it doesn't support that doctrine the way you think it does or as strongly, and sometimes it can actually be completely opposite. What's an example of that that may be one of the more common that missionaries use? Well, one of the ones that missionaries will hear a lot probably is Revelation 22, 18 to 19, which says, you know, if anyone adds to the words of this book, they'll be cursed and destroyed. And people tend to take that to refer to the entire Bible. And usually missionaries have learned a couple proof texts against that, maybe out of Deuteronomy or out of Proverbs that say similar things. And that's kind of the first stage is, well, what do other things say about this that sounds right. similar? How do other texts contextualize this in the broader scheme of ideas? But I've written a little bit about this for FAIR if you go back 15 years, I think. We can put a link to it. When we look at cultural things, it was very common in the ancient world on an important text, on a law code or a royal decree, to protect that text by closing with a curse on anyone who modified the text. And this is because there's no such thing as copy control. You know, there's no, uh, you can't change this PDF. Uh, there's, there are no <laughs> watermarks, right? right? So obviously the king's decree, the king would want whatever he decreed to actually happen, not to be the law, something yeah. else, right? And so the best example for explaining Revelation 22, 18 to 19 is not these other passages that say no one else can add to this, but uh, in the book of Ezra, I think it's Ezra chapter 6 or 9, I can't remember, there's a royal decree from the Persian king who is sending the Israelites back to Israel to rebuild their temple. And he says, I'm decreeing that they get money out of the royal treasury to rebuild the temple. This is my decree. Anyone who changes this decree will be cursed. Their house will be pulled down and become a dung heap and let them be <laughs> impaled on it. And so this is another one of those examples. Well, in Revelation, you've got this decree from God, essentially, that is closing and saying, and anyone who changes this royal divine decree, let them be cursed. And of course, Revelation was not the last book of the New Testament written. It wasn't compiled in um, what we think of as a book is technically called a codex. And codices are kind of a newer technology. Originally, the book of Revelation would have existed as a standalone letter and then probably as a standalone scroll. And only later on would it become a book bound with other books of the New Testament and, and come at the end. Right. So, so that's one of, the, one of the proof text missionaries we'll see a lot. And usually people who will throw it at you are not really interested in learning about the ancient pattern of <laughs> protecting text through curses. Right. Right. So it's usually pretty futile to argue with people when they're throwing proof texts at you because they're just trying to prove you wrong. They're usually much less interested in actual conversation. Well, we, to a point, they, they want to – I think part of proof texting, as you said before, was, it, it almost feels like I'm trying to win an argument. Yeah, we tend to turn to proof texts when we're already convinced of our position and we're just going l hunting for support, whatever right. looks like it can fit. Yeah. So this is actually one of the kind of to bridge proof texting to this conversation of how those of other faiths use the Bible – that is some of the way that people do use the Bible as part of their just their faith tradition. I mean, I saw this a lot in the South. Where I served, this was very common. Proof texts were thrown at missionaries all the time. But does that say something about how these other faiths use the Bible? It, it does, especially when you get into Protestantism. And I will probably end up generalizing a little bit because we don't have time to go into sure. deep detail. And there are different kinds of Protestants and all kinds of different ways that the Bible fits into their faith. But in general, Protestantism rejected the authority of an interpreter between people and Scripture. That is, in response to the Catholic Church, where the Catholic Church said, here is what Scripture means for people of faith, for Christians. And Martin Luther and Zwingli and Calvin said, we reject that authority. The Bible is the only authority. This is sometimes referred to as one of the five solas, sola scriptura. It means the Bible is the final arbiter, the final judge of what is doctrinal and what isn't. And so because the Bible becomes so central, 
some parts of Protestantism developed ideas of inerrancy and infallibility. And, and for some Protestants, those mean the same thing. For some Protestants, they mean different things. But generally, for especially for evangelicals, which is kind of a loose subset of Protestants, it is extremely important to them that the Bible be perfect. Because if the Bible is not perfect, then it is not completely trustworthy and your faith completely falls apart. And so oftentimes, Mormons don't have problems with contradiction in Scripture or inconsistency or things that don't make sense because for us, we're a lot more like Catholicism in the sense that there is this authority that's kind of between us and Scripture. That is, to a point, yeah. we, we have prophets and apostles who say, we have continuing revelation, we interpret Scripture, we make doctrine. Mormons are not sola scriptura. And in fact, sometimes when you're talking to Protestants, Protestants will assume that Mormons think like Protestants, approach Scripture like Protestants. Sure. We just have a bigger canon. We just accept the Book of Mormon and other Scripture. And so if they can show that there are inconsistencies in Mormon Scripture, between Mormon Scripture and the Bible— then we shouldn't have faith in the gospel as preached by Mormons and we should just accept the Jesus of the Bible and become Protestants. Right. And so sometimes Mormons, especially missionaries, will try to show that there are inconsistencies in the Bible and we don't understand why they react so strongly against that. And that's because for them, that is attacking the core. Absolutely. Because if the Bible isn't trustworthy, the gospel can't be true and you can't trust in Jesus. And so they, they connect those very, very closely. What missionaries and Mormons are really asking other people to do is to change the way they think about authority. We are not asking them to believe that um, the word of wisdom and celestial marriage and things like that are found within the Bible necessarily. What we are asking them to do is to shift the way they think about authority from simply scripture to scripture and modern prophets and apostles. Which is a big shift. Which is a big shift. And a lot of times we misunderstand that, especially American missionaries. We live in a very Protestant country. We absorb a lot of Protestant ideas just by nature of living here. It's, it's in the air. And so a lot of times what you'll find is when someone challenges us on the word of wisdom, we will try to prove that to them out of the Bible. And uh, we'll try to say things like, well, you know, wine is just really grape juice, which isn't true at all. But the reason why we do that is because they already accept the authority of the Bible. And if we can show that this doctrine falls under that authority, then they'll just accept it. Right. That's the hope. And that, that's the hope. And that's, in some ways, that's the easy way to do things. And really what we're trying to do is say, yeah, I, I will agree with you that Jesus drank wine. And he says he'll drink wine again. And that's fine, but we have to remember that God sometimes changes things, whether that's circumcision or the law of Moses. And the reason we don't drink alcohol is not because it's located in the Bible. We are not sola scriptura. We are not scripture alone, right. but because we believe in modern prophets and apostles and that revelation came through them to say, we don't drink alcohol. That's much less comfortable because we know up front, they don't accept modern prophets and apostles. Right. They accept the Bible. Yeah. And so what we really want to ask them to do is to say, if we take that approach, I don't do this not because of the Bible, but because of modern prophets and apostles, then you can kind of bring it back to the Book of Mormon and say, as we're preaching, what you need to do to figure out if this is true is not, does Jesus drink wine in the Bible? Right. That's not going to prove anything. does the Book of Mormon come through Joseph Smith and God, and are there modern prophets and apostles? And so, again, that's not something missionaries really get trained to do. That's not the way they think about it because of these Protestant ideas that we absorb. But that's, at its base, what we're asking people to do is accept this new way of thinking about authority that includes Scripture, but also modern prophets and apostles. Yeah, so we don't fight proof texting with proof texting. Right. We don't, we don't want to do what Joseph Smith talked about in his story, and that is add to the confusion where we cannot settle in a— a question by an appeal to the Bible. Exactly. That was what he talked about, what he prayed about, and that's why that story might be even more significant in that sense. Exactly. He learned very quickly that you can't prove things out of the Bible. Or put another way, you can prove whatever you want out of the Bible. <laughs> right. It's the question of how well grounded it is. Sure. The Bible's not always internally consistent about things itself, 
And we really shouldn't expect it to be because it's written over a thousand years by different people in different contexts. And again, we believe in this idea of line upon line, that God reveals and changes new things as we progress. One of the other examples that missionaries might be very familiar with, especially if you're in America in the South, maybe you're talking to Baptists, is the idea of faith and works. Mm -hmm. And this is a fairly complicated topic, but I think most missionaries, they go out, they're green, they meet someone, their trainer says, oh, well, when they give you this scripture, you give them that scripture. Right. And and it's kind of like meeting, what's the phrase, when... uh, an immovable object meets irresistible force. You know, you, <laughs> it's not going to get anywhere. It's not going to get anywhere. And so, what you have to do is a little bit of a deeper study and figure out how these make sense together. And if I can kind of jump several stages ahead, in terms of cultural context, Paul, who often gets invoked in faith and works discussion and things like that, as well as James and James, Paul didn't invent the term grace. Or the idea. He's drawing on the Old Testament. He is drawing on some Jewish things from the time, which we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls, actually, that when Paul talks about works, he is talking about the required works of the law, ritual works, not not simply actions that you do, but the the works of the Torah. Paul was a Greco-Roman guy. He was Jewish, but he wasn't a Jerusalemite. Let's put it that way. We know from... Greek discoveries of the last hundred years that the terms faith and grace had a place outside Christianity in a Greco-Roman culture. And Paul borrowed these and brought them in. And so very briefly put, there was a thing in Greco-Roman culture called the patron-client relationship. That is, there were powerful, wealthy people, and most people were not that. Most people were just average Joes trying to survive. And when you had a problem you couldn't solve, it might be a debt, it might be your crops failed, it might be something else, what you would do is you would go to someone rich and powerful and you would essentially ask them for a favor. They would become your patron and you would become their client. And so the patron would do this thing for you that you could not do yourself and that was termed grace. And in return, what the client owed the patron was not a quid pro quo, but that they would essentially be loyal to the patron. They would be faithful to them. They would speak well of the patron, and they would do what the patron asked them to. They, they wouldn't become like a slave or a servant, or but you know, if the patron said, you know, I've got something I want you to do, part of this relationship, the patron-client relationship, was that you would do that. He could call in a favor, would we say it yeah. that way? Yeah, and that, that loyalty was termed faith. In our King James Bible, a bunch of words that are very closely related in Greek and Hebrew come out very differently in English. And so faith, which we think of today as kind of, here's an idea, I, I accept I that that it. idea is true. Yeah, Faith... And faithfulness and loyalty and trust are very tightly related concepts. And the idea that faith means, here's an idea, I accept it. That's a very late development. That's not what they're talking about in the Bible at all. That is, one of the passages that gets quoted in the New Testament in one of these faith works discussion, uh, to make opposite points, by the way, is Genesis 15, 6, where God says to Abraham, I know you're old and you still don't have kids, but I promise you, you're going to have kids. And it says that Abraham believed God and God counted it to him as faithfulness. That is, Abraham trusted that what God said was true. He put his faith and his trust in that relationship with God that those things would happen. So it's much less of an intellectual checklist of ideas or doctrines that you must accept belief and faith as much as trust and acceptance of this relationship with God, the patron-client relationship. God does things for us that we can't do for ourselves. He gets us out of sin and death. And in return, we owe God trust and loyalty and uh, obedience. Although that, again, sounds like he's the general giving marching orders. And that's that's not quite how the relationship works. God is our patron, and we're the clients who have accepted that he's got us out of this terrible situation. Yeah. So the Greek... If I remember the Greek concept of pistis was that trust. Yeah. And it was almost like, you could almost, almost call it a, an economic term, right? Yeah. And I think today there are some people that still use it that way because we have in like a mortgage contract, you have your 
Well, you can good put money into ex- a trust. Estimate. And yeah, you can do that. So like if, if you have a good faith estimate, it's if, you, if we give you the house, you pay us this much for the yeah. house, and this is how much you'll pay in interest. And yep. So it, in a sense, there's also terms that are kind of laid out in some respects. And so I think that's where when we talk about faith, it's not just this ambiguous belief in something. Right. But it's, it's a set of things that we've agreed to do because we trust in that relationship, yeah. as you said. Yeah. So there's other things that we, we do with the Bible as missionaries where we, we do try and use it. We used to call it bashing. Where we yep. Bible bashing, where we use it to try and prove our case. And even if we go into it with this understanding, like with Revelation of this is the king's you know, decree, what are realistic approaches that people can and should use the Bible when they are sharing things with people that are Protestant or even Catholic that might help them at least warm to the ideas of Mormonism's claims? Well, I, I think... It requires kind of a spirit of discernment. Uh, Oftentimes, especially when you do get into bashing with someone, things that are kind of debate style rarely change anyone's mind, at least directly. Now, if there are other people who are listening who might be more open, then sometimes it's worth having that kind of... uh, That arrow in your quiver? Head-to-head conversation. I see. That, you know, I may not be getting anywhere with the person I'm talking to, but if there are 10 other people listening, they might go, oh, you know, this guy actually has a point and there's something here maybe that I should I look see. into. But when you're just talking to one or two people, you really have to discern, are these people who are open or am I wasting my time talking to them? Now, there are certainly things in Mormon doctrine that are better supported in the Bible than a lot of people think, like the idea that we can become as God is, or as mm-hmm. Peter says, partakers of the divine nature. Right. That has a lot of support in the Bible. And so oftentimes we need to kind of map out where can I legitimately say, well, no, actually this this is in the Bible. It may not be as clear. It may not be as central, but it is there. Right. Even if Mormons don't derive our belief in that from interpretation of the Bible. Because remember again, Protestants, they have no central authority. If the Bible says something, you are supposed to believe that. And so, again, they do have a stake in if the Bible says something weird, you've got to diffuse that because otherwise you've got to believe or do that weird thing. Right. You've got to get around it somehow. And for Mormons and Catholics and Jews, because Jews also kind of have a a central, at least historically, the rabbis kind of worked as this intermediary. Right. Right. If if it says something weird, that doesn't necessarily affect you unless the authority says, well— Here's how we understand that, and that affects you, and you can't have milk with meat. That's, <laughs> yeah. That is our ruling. The, the central authority kind of works like the Supreme Court that way. There's what the law says, and then there is what the court interprets the law to be for the average person. Got it. Right? And so you, you should, ideally, you would know your Bible well, and you would know those scriptures and be able to help people see, well, yeah, I know that the Bible says this in one place, but it also says something different in another place, and can we come to an agreement on why it says both in context? Right. Looking at why they might be speaking to different people. And this actually helps explain, going back to faith and works, why Paul and James seem to be saying such completely different things. They're speaking to different audiences. And for Paul, he's talking to a very Jewish audience that is saying, you may accept Jesus as Messiah, but you still have to keep the, the law, ritual the works. works of the law. And Paul is kind of saying, no, you don't. James, on the other hand, is addressing more of a Greco-Roman audience with more of a philosophical background that would be more of the um, belief as kind of an intellectual assent to ideas. And he's saying it's not enough to intellectually assent to those ideas. You actually have to do things. It, it's not enough to accept Jesus as your Lord if you don't do what he tells you to do. Yeah. You can't go to a patron and say, please help me with this problem, and then walk away and not keep your end of the deal, your end of the relationship. That simply doesn't work. Right. We have to do better than simply memorize certain scriptures and say, ah, oh, when they do this, I pull out that. You know, like if if they kick high, yeah. I block low, and then you move into a roundhouse. Right. It's That's not a strategy That's not the way it that works. Way. Yeah. It, it, it's not a strategy. It's not a... When they do this, you counter with that. Yeah. But again, a lot of people who may be interested in talking to missionaries are interested in converting the missionaries 
not necessarily learning what Mormonism really thinks, because again, a lot of Protestants think Mormons are just like Protestants, but with a bigger canon of scripture. Right. You know, we are still scripture alone. It's just, we have more scriptures and that's really not what we are. Right. So we talk now about how much the missionaries should know the Bible. So let's talk briefly about personal study, about approach to that and and how a missionary might be able to come to understand some of these contextual things. For example, I, I actually borrowed one of your presentations that you gave a while back and tried to teach this to a gospel doctrine class in my ward about the ways that different books of Scripture were written, genres. And the literary context all that and genre. Kind of stuff. Yeah, that's yeah. huge. And How it, did that go? It was interesting. Um, it's a new idea for a lot of people. Well, and, and it was interesting to see the difference in acceptance based on age. Yeah. The story that caught people really the strongest was the concept that Jonah wasn't literal history, that there wasn't a man right. that was swallowed by a great fish. That, that the author of Jonah didn't intend to be telling a history. Right. He, he probably intended to be telling a satirical parable. Well, and what's funny about that is I, I shared the quotes that you gave from C.S. Lewis and other scholars, and I said that, you know, there is no one claiming that this is literal history. Right. In fact— and this was where you could see their faces, like, drop. I opened to the Bible dictionary in our scriptures where it calls it a poem. Yeah. And they were like, oh, my gosh, this whole time <laughs> I thought there was literally a guy sitting in the gut of a fish. And they got spewed out. And then they see that even our own Bible dictionary calls it a poem. Yeah. They, I, I want to say that, that it looked like they lost their faith for a second. Right. Because right. they thought, how could I have thought this for so long? And yet it was right there in front of them. Right. So there's a lot that we don't approach the, the Old Testament specifically in, in a very healthy way. So what are some beginner ways that we can introduce these concepts of genre, reading the Bible through genre and th things like that? Well— Because that could take a while, yeah, I know. I, I, think, I think the very first thing you need to do is you need to read it. Read the Bible. You, yeah. It, <laughs> actually read it. Actually read it. Not just the you know, verse. <laughs> start at the beginning and go to the end and read it. That can be kind of radical because it's it's not what we do in our classes necessarily. Right. Mm -hmm. Not even in seminary. We jump from right. lesson to lesson. Yeah. And sometimes we invoke a particular verse and we only read that verse and we don't really get the context around. But first off, you need to read it. As difficult as it may be, I would say read it in the King James first because that's kind of the language Joseph Smith inherited and tried to use in our other scriptures, and there are some important ties there. The second thing I would say is pick up another translation. Now, depending on where you're serving a mission, you may be using a non-English translation. Right. And the, the irony here is non-English speaking Latter-day Saints have a great advantage with the Bible because the Bibles that are officially adopted in other countries— are much newer than the King James translation. But that often strikes people as, really, can we do that? Can right. we read other <laughs> Bible translations? And there are examples in General Conference and the Enzyme of Apostles citing other mm -hmm. translations. I required another translation when I taught New Testament at BYU 10 years ago. And so there's nothing wrong with reading other translations. The King James Bible is the official Bible of the church, and I recommend studying both. The King James Bible... I should say two things about it briefly. The King James Bible is a good translation, but it was a good translation 500 years ago. The problem is that language changes, and we don't speak the English from 600 years ago. Right. That's, that's one big problem. The other problem is that the manuscripts that the King James Bible were translated from are very late manuscripts, and we have much older and better manuscripts now. And also, thanks to about the last 150 years of discovery of the ancient Near East, we now have a much, much better understanding of the languages. Uh, to give one quick example, the King James translators of the New Testament, who were from Oxford and Cambridge, the dialect that the New Testament was in was unique to them. They, they didn't, there was no Greek like it anywhere else. And so they decided that this was Holy Spirit Greek. When okay. the Spirit inspires you, your Greek sounds like this. It doesn't sound like Homer or Attic Greek or Classical Greek. And in the last 150 years, we have turned up so much more Greek material from the time period in the area that now scholars understand this isn't Holy Spirit Greek. This is lay, street, common, 
Greek. This is how your average uneducated Greek speaker spoke. And so now it's called Koine Greek or Common Greek. And for the Old Testament, that goes double because we now have far more than Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic cognates. We now have Assyrian and Babylonian and Sumerian plays in and Ugaritic and all these other things. So modern translations are better in the sense that they are in our language today. They use much better and older manuscripts. And the scholars who are translating them have a much better understanding of the intricacies of Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. This is where that article of faith comes in, where we believe the Bible as far as it is translated correctly. Right. And this really tests that for a lot of people. And the the reason why the King James Bible got adopted by the church as the official translation, which really wasn't until the 1950s and 60s, by the way, was mostly because it seems to have been what Joseph Smith used. But Joseph Smith, of course, also studied Hebrew. Hebrew, He studied a little German. He studied a little Greek. And he actually declared that Luther's German translation was the best translation. I didn't there, know that. There are reasons for that that are interesting, but so uh, first off, read the Bible. Start with the King James Version. Yeah. Second, get yourself a modern translation. Not all translations are created equal. I recommend something called the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, which is actually a great grandchild translation. That is, the King James Version wasn't new. It was a revision. Sure. And so the NRSV is a revision of a revision of a revision of the King James Version based on the newer manuscripts and language and things. So it's it's in the same family, at least. Very few other Christians today use the King James Version. And so a lot of times if we pull out a verse in the King James, they will say, well, that's not what my Bible says. Which is interesting considering the approach you talked about before, that, that the Bible is sacrosanct. It's, it's, it's a perfect text, yet they're accepting of other translations. Right. They're, they're accepting of other translations because they recognize that the English is not necessarily the Bible. It's a translation of the Bible. Right. Similarly, when, when someone tells you, well, the Bible says X, it, sometimes it's useful to say, well, which book of the Bible says that? Because sometimes other books say other things. Right. I, I think I've said that once or twice, but to give an example, if you go to the Old Testament, there is differing views as to whether sin and righteousness carry on beyond you. That is, in the, in the Ten Commandments, it says that God curses those who hate him to the third and fourth generation, where it sounds like children bear the sins of their parents, in a sense. Right. And then he says, but to the thousandth generation of those who love me, I bless. So it's kind of like, well, okay, if, if sin carries over to the third or fourth generation, at least blessing carries over to the thousandth generation. Right. But then later on in Jeremiah and some other places, you find them saying very bluntly, children do not bear the responsibility or have the effects of either their parents' righteousness or their parents' sin. And so you kind of have to say, well, why are they saying these different things? How, how do we square these? Right. So that's, that's just one example of where different books can say different things. You have to understand where they're coming from, why they're saying it the way they are, and maybe not even take it so literally, right? Yeah. Like the, the forgiving people seven times 70. That wasn't right. a, an actual mathematical number that he was going for. Yeah, that's actually a function of the King James again. 70 times seven is being very literal. And what Jesus is actually saying is just 77, not 490. Okay. So to reiterate again, read the Bible, start with the King James Version, pick up another translation and kind of Actually, try to look at, you know, read a couple of verses in the other translation, go back to the King James and note differences and how things sound different. And then if you want to go one step behind that, I would say pick up what's called a study Bible. Mm-hmm. Now, you know that in our quad, that these things were put in in 1978, 1981, there are footnotes. Right. There's a topical guide. There is a Bible dictionary. That Bible dictionary actually came from an old Cambridge Bible dictionary that Mormons adapted. And these Robert Matthews, are, correct? Uh, the Robert Matthews was on the committee that did it. Elder McConkie was deeply involved in adapting that. We have chapter headings. We have chapters and verses that are an imposition on the text. Those came into the Bible in the medieval age. They don't exist in ancient manuscripts. Really. Okay. There are thought dividers, but certainly not verses. And a study Bible includes an introduction to every book, and they include extensive footnotes explaining geography and culture and translation. They will give cross-references. And sometimes, depending on what study Bible you pick up, these can be done from a denominational perspective. 
For example, there's the NIV Study Bible that stands for New International Version, which is evangelical. And so the the footnotes kind of come from a conservative Protestant perspective. One of the ones I like is called the Jewish Study Bible. So it's Old Testament only or Hebrew Bible, as they would say. Mm -hmm. The order of books is different. I really like the introductions and the footnotes in that. Obviously, they come. The HarperCollins one. The HarperCollins is the other one that I would recommend. Yeah. It's Um, been interesting to study with it. Yeah. And oftentimes, I will set my footnotes against each other. And sometimes I will agree with my NIV. And sometimes I will agree with my Jewish Study Bible. And sometimes the HarperCollins. And it kind of depends. And so the the HarperCollins is written from a denominationally neutral perspective. That is, the people who were involved do have their own faith, but it's a it's a committee made up of people of different faiths, Jewish, Catholic, Protestant, I don't think any Mormons. And so what those notes are is what they can agree on in terms of history, culture, language, translation. Yeah. Whereas something like the NIV or the Jewish Study Bible will reflect more denominational and doctrinal understandings from that group. So if you look at the Jewish Study Bible in Isaiah 53, which gets quoted in Mosiah 14, which we understand to be kind of messianic prophecy— The Jewish commentary on that will explicitly say, this is obviously not messianic prophecy about Jesus. Because, of (laughs) course, they're coming from a Jewish perspective. We should expect that, right? There is not yet a Mormon study Bible. There is something you can find online that was done by a group of LDS scholars, including Kevin Barney and John Gee, and we can put a link to that, which is footnotes to the New Testament. Okay. You can also find something freely online called the Net Bible, the New Electronic Translation, Mm, which I believe is also Protestant, but its advantage is it's free online, and because it's not printed on paper, you can have endless notes. Right. And so those notes tend to focus on translation, a little bit of background, a little bit of culture. So, once more, read the Bible, (laughs) start with the King James, get another translation, look into picking up a study Bible. And then I would say, take notes, collect what you learn, because otherwise you forget it, you don't come back to it, you lose it. Yeah. And uh, especially today, you can make your own LDS.org login, and you can annotate your scriptures electronically. Right. You can copy in as much as you want there. And the nice thing for missionaries is, when you go on a mission, you might have a tablet or a smartphone. Right. And you will have those notes you created before your mission, they're on your phone. As long as the church servers are running and, you know, we're not some post-apocalyptic thing, you will not lose those notes right. if you lose your mission scriptures or something or, right. or if there's water damage. And right. so you can, you can carry that information with you. So the next time you go to James 1.5, <laughs> you have all the information you you've there. gathered on yeah. James 1.5, whether that's from the Bible or from church history. And you, you keep that information and you build on it and you progress. Yeah. Here would be my advice about what to prioritize. The Old Testament is bigger than all the other standard works put together. Right. And a lot of it will not be directly relevant to what you're teaching on your mission. My advice would be focus on the New Testament. In the Old Testament, read the book of Genesis and uh, maybe Samuel and Kings because that's where the history is of the Israelites and the promised land and David and Saul and Solomon and all of that stuff. When you read the New Testament, what you'll find is that they quote the Old Testament a lot. And Jesus' favorite books apparently were Deuteronomy, Isaiah, and Psalms, which are not things we read very much, if at all. So focus on the New Testament, which is what I did on my mission. I don't know a lot of mission presidents who would have a problem with taking that other translation with you if you are an English-speaking missionary. I am told by some missionaries that depending on the mission, there is an app that you can use that actually has multiple Bible translations that is approved, but it's mission-specific depending on the mission president and who is setting the apps for whatever is your device in that mission. I don't remember what it's called, but it's available to some. Yeah. Well, there's a lot more we can go into. This is a subject that— We could talk for hours. Yeah, could definitely go on forever. But I think this is a really good starting point for missionary work in the sense that we we have an understanding of where other people are coming from and even the ways that we may sometimes use and misuse the Bible in our missionary efforts. And the Bible is really our bridge to other Christians and Jews. And even Muslims to some extent, you know? Absolutely. The way they view the Quran is very similar to the way Protestants view the Bible. Right. The Quran assumes knowledge of the Bible. It says that they were inspired prophets. Yeah. 
It's our bridge. That's Ignore it at your peril. <laughs> you will be a more effective missionary if you know the Bible well. Absolutely. Well, thank you again for coming in and sharing all this with us. And we'll put some links to the many different sources that we have and maybe even some videos that you've posted on YouTube. And uh, I want to encourage everybody to go listen to them. I think there's quite a bit there that we could learn to help us reframe our scripture study in a very productive way. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed that interview. There's so much to learn about the Bible, both Old and New Testaments. We as Latter-day Saints, we have our own biblical traditions, of course, and some of those we actually borrow from other faiths, and some are our own. But if we're to be successful teachers of the gospel, to be good missionaries, it's always a good idea to know as much as we can about the Bible, what it really is, what it's meant to say, and what it was meant to teach. It may sound kind of weird, but the Book of Mormon will become more meaningful the more you study the Bible and come to know the spirit and truthfulness of its teachings, as opposed to the sometimes random misquotes that pop up from time to time. I recognize that some of what was said in this conversation is definitely something that needs to be filtered through a mission president. Not every mission president is going to be okay with a missionary studying from some of the sources that were mentioned in this interview. But at some point in your life, perhaps either before or after your mission, or maybe during, depending on what your mission president says, these different sources and these different approaches can be very valuable to you in your personal study and in coming to a deeper and richer understanding of the gospel. Let's make sure, if anything, we are not missionaries who use proof texting in our teaching efforts. Let's try to find ways to use context, to use the truthfulness of the message to help allow the Spirit to speak more effectively, to touch the hearts of the people we teach with greater power. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of LDS Mission Cast. Remember, you can listen to this episode or any of our past episodes at LDSMissionCast.com, or you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or on the podcast app on your iOS devices. Thanks again for listening.